Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the rifles that they're going to be selling in their upcoming February of 2017 regional auction. And I discovered while looking through the catalog for this auction that they have a lot of Finnish Mos Nagants. So we're going to take this opportunity today to do a grand overview of Finnish Mos Nagants. Now, a lot of people are probably familiar with the Mosin. This was adopted uh, first in 1891 by Russia, uh, later to become the Soviet Union. It was a standard rifle in World War I, standard rifle in World War II. They are ubiquitous on the US market today. But most of the ones that are here in the US are Russian or Soviet guns. It, the Finnish guns are rather less common and rather less appreciated by some, although I think that's changing rapidly. So, Finland obtained its independence from Russia in 1917 with the Russian Revolution. There was a, a brief civil war in Finland between the Whites and the Reds that ended in 1918 with the victory of the White Finnish, uh, non-communists, and they ended up with like 190,000 Russian Mosin Nagant rifles that had been in Finland when the Finns got their independence. So that was the start of the Finnish arsenal. Now they had other guns, they in fact had a fairly wide variety of other guns, but the single most numerous thing that they had was the M91 Mosin Nagant. So that's what the Finnish military formally adopted. Now it's important as we go through this story to recognize that there are two separate entities here. We have the Finnish army and we have the Finnish civil guard, whose name in Finnish I'm not even going to try to pronounce. And kind of like in the US we have the army and the national guard. Um, they were separate, in, separate independent organizations and they actually did their own independent weapons procurement. So the army had army rifles and the civil guard had civil guard rifles and they're not necessarily the same guns. Now to begin with they were pretty much all Mosinagans, Russian M91s. But fairly quickly the army decides it really wants a better rifle. So the army starts experimenting and unfortunately they don't really have the money to develop or purchase anything brand new. And what they're left with are, well, these huge stockpiles of Mosin Nagants. So in 1924 they adapt, they adopt an upgraded version, they call it the M24, and it looks like an M91, it looks like a Russian Mosin Nagant, but the Finns have made some improvements to them. Uh, they've cleaned up the triggers, in a lot of these cases if the barrel wasn't really good they replaced the barrel. And that's how you'll normally identify these, is the, the Russian barrel is gone, there's a Finnish barrel on the rifle with Finnish markings, Finnish date, Finnish serial number. They basically refurbished these guns and brought them up to Finnish accuracy standards, at least as much as they could with this pattern of rifle that they were starting with. Now they did also, they left the rear sight in place, but they remarked it. So these early M91 Mosins, you know, basically World War I and earlier era guns, had their rear sights marked in arshins, which was a Russian unit of measurement, roughly equivalent to one pace. So about, I believe the conversion is uh, three quarters of an arshin equal one meter. And as a, you know, as a unit of measurement for rifle shooting, a pace makes a lot of sense actually, when you, your, your way of measuring is simply to walk out the distance to the target to see how far it is, instead of having you know, a laser rangefinder. So, M24s are the first iteration of, of truly Finnish Mosin Nagant. Now during this whole time the Finns never actually manufactured a single receiver. They had these 190,000 that they started with, and between 19, the 1920s and through 1941 they bought another 173,000 Mosins from pretty much everybody around. They bought them from Bulgaria, Albania, uh, Russia at some points when they were on good, good relations with the Russians. Um, a lot of the Baltic states, uh, France, basically a lot of people had ended up with most Nagants as a result of World War I, and most of those countries were standardizing on other guns like Mausers, and they were quite happy to sell off their surplus most Nagants. Finland was in the reverse situation, quite happy to buy them. Now from a collector's point of view this becomes really interesting, because all of a sudden you've got Mosin, Finnish Mosins made with just this huge smorgasbord of uh, receivers from other manufacturers and other dates. It's interesting to note that there are in particular a lot of Finnish Mosins made on American Mosin Nagant receivers, Remington and Westinghouse receivers, so you'll find those fairly regularly. And typically all of the markings on a Russian Mosin are going to be on the barrel shank, and the Finns got rid of those. So with the, the Finnish receivers you actually have to pull the receiver out of the stock, 
you look at the underside of the tang, and that's where you'll typically find an arsenal mark and date that will allow you to figure out where this receiver actually came from. But the salient point here is the Finns never manufactured a single Mosin-Nagant receiver. They didn't have the tooling to do it, nothing. Um, and they didn't really manufacture a lot of other parts, they didn't manufacture bolts, what they made were ancillary things. They made stocks, barrels, sights, furniture. All right, at this point let's uh, go ahead and take a closer look at some of the little features and markings and interesting details of this M91, and then we'll follow the lineage as it develops through the M27, 28, the 28-30, and ultimately the Finnish M39. I think I can argue without getting too much pushback from anyone that if it is truly possible to turn a sow's ear into a silk purse, the Finns accomplished that by turning Russian World War I Mos Nagants into Finnish M39 rifles. Probably, almost certainly, the best pattern of Mos Nagant anyone ever made. The refurbishment program of Russian M91s took a couple different forms in Finland, and really it was kind of a custom process. Uh, each rifle was assessed individually, and the arsenal or, or repair depot would determine what exact changes it needed. So things like relining the sight numbers were done to all the rifles, but if a rifle had a really good barrel, it might not get a replacement at that point. Uh, triggers would be tweaked, uh, smoothed out and improved, uh, barrel shims were sometimes added to improve accuracy of the guns, if the bore was good but the muzzle had been damaged, uh, the barrel might be simply counterbored. A lot of changes like these were uh, were made. So uh, new barrels, when they were necessary, were done by in a couple of different ways in this early in the early years of this process. So uh, Tika Koski, uh, as we know it today, Tika, did make new barrels. Um, they did also buy barrels from a couple other sources, including foreign sources. And one of the one of the other methods used, they actually tried the Italian Salerno method of relining bores. Uh, those you'll find marked with a P on the barrel's uh, shank, a P26 or a P27. There's a lot of political skullduggery kind of involved in that reboring process. There was a lot of controversy uh, for a while about whether they, the process was safe. It looks like that was actually done as a political motive to discredit some of the people in the arms division. It, it's a mess, we're not going to get into that. And, and serious Finnish rifle collectors will know that there is a whole wide variety of specific types of uh, remanufactured or repaired or rebarreled M91s, and that's a little bit beyond the scope of this. So the markings on this one are a little bit faint, but you can see that we have a VKT marking there. Uh, D indicates heavy ball, that was something that was done a little bit later in the war. Uh, when the Finns started to capture large amounts of Russian ammunition, they changed their bore diameter specification uh, in order to better fit Russian ammunition. Now, you'll notice this, this rifle is dated 1941. I've been talking about these being done in the 1920s, and that's true. Um, the, this process stopped in the late 1920s, but then it picked back up again in 1940. They restarted the process of redoing M91s because M39 production uh, was still taking off. So it, they needed the rifles uh, during the Winter War, so they, they started re, they, they restarted the conversion process uh, or update process on these old M91s. And in fact it's probably more common to find these rifles with 1940s dates. Something else I want to point out, and we'll touch on this a little bit later I think, um, these sling swivels are a very distinctive Finnish uh, retrofit. There are probably about a half a dozen different styles of Finnish sling swivels, um, different things that they did at different times and for different reasons with the rifles, but this is one of them. Uh, the Russian setup actually had a slot through the stock which required a, a loop, called, typically called a dog collar, um, a leather sling loop in the stock, and then you would attach your sling to that. Well that was easy to damage and, and not didn't, didn't appeal to the Finnish sensibility, so they replaced those uh, slots with actual sling swivels. We have that here on the back as well. Uh, when you see this, that's a very, at a glance you know that a rifle with those, that style of sling swivel has been modified by the Finns. So one other marking to get used to seeing if you're going to get interested in Finnish rifles is this SA in a rectangle. That is a Finnish army property marking. 
Important to note that it is not related to the Civil Guard, and a rifle that has only been in Civil Guard service will not have that stamp. But most of these guns ended up at one point or another being used by the Finnish Army, and they will have that SA. Alright, and lastly, the conversion to the rear sights. In, when these were made by the Russians, they were marked 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12, and those are hundreds of arshans, and this bottom four step was a single step. This is a good example of one of those rifles where they really thought you know, battle was going to be taking place at, at very long ranges because the new small bore smokeless powder rifles allowed it. So 400 Arshin zero is like a 300 meter zero, which is really quite a long ways for a, a minimum zero distance on the rifle. Uh, certainly too long to be practical for the fins. The fins cut an additional step at the bottom of the, the sight. They then remarked it with two, that's a very faint uh, two there, so the bottom step is now 200 meters, and then three, four, five and a half, because that without, without recutting the stairs, uh, that particular one equates to 550 meters, seven, and lastly eight and a half. So they made these adjustments to the rear sight, because of course the fins weren't conversant in arshans because they used meters. So in the 1920s the army really is, is getting kind of tired of most of the guns. They'd really like a newer, better rifle. The uh, M91 or M24 is, it's long, it's heavy, it's awkward. They're really, honestly, they're not the greatest bolt action rifle design ever made. Not bad, but in the Russian duration there's a lot left to be desired. So unfortunately for the Finnish army, Finland doesn't have the money to develop an entirely new and better rifle. Uh, they have a whole lot of Mosinagants and that's what they're going to have to work with. So the army grudgingly admits or agrees to work with an improved version of the Mosinagant, and that's going to become the M27. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the M27 is going to be an army rifle. So this is distinct from the Civil Guard. We'll get to what the Civil Guard is going to do about the same question uh, a little bit later. So what do they do to improve the Russian Mosnagant? They're going to do a bunch of things. Uh, they're going to replace all the barrels, they're going to reduce the barrel length by 15 and a half centimeters. So the original M91 barrels are 80 centimeters long, that's 31 and a half inches. They're going to drop that down to 27 inches or 68 and a half centimeters. So a nice reduction, that gets them down to like typical European short rifle length, which is definitely an improvement on the Mosin. They're going to uh, add some nice big protective wings to the front sight, right up there. A, another real improvement over the unprotected front sight of the M91. They're going to do a little bit to improve the sights, we'll take a look at those up close uh, in a few moments. They're going to improve the nose cap. Now this is a late pattern one, we'll look at the early pattern. What they want is a nose cap that allows them to remove the rear handguard without having to take the entire stock uh, without having to remove the nose cap entirely from the rifle. So they're going to come up with a hinged design. We'll take a look at that as well. Now in total about 71,500 of these M27s were manufactured, and they were made starting, the, the first rifles were produced right at the end of 1927, they actually came into service in 1928, and production, uh, large scale production would go until 1935, uh, ultimately they would be produced through 1940. So let's take a look at a few of these details up close. Alright, let's start with a feature that I haven't, didn't actually mention yet, and that is a mechanical change to the bolt itself. They were concerned with the potential misfeeding, because the bolt kind of wobbles around on these, and so they actually added a pair of little ribs to the very back of uh, this bolt guide. So here's a standard most Nagant bolt, you can see there's nothing there. There is this little guide here on the M27 bolt. At the same time they also cut a pair of slots in the back of the receiver to mate up with those two little ribs, and the idea was that this would stabilize the bolt at the end of its travel and uh, improve things. Now this was only done uh, until 1933, they stopped cutting these slots in 33, because they realized, well a couple problems came up. One of them, probably the most significant problem, is that this becomes an easy spot for dirt or sand or even snow or ice to get into. And if the front of this slot gets packed up with some debris, 
all of a sudden you can't close the bolt because you have to have some place for these ribs to actually go. And if they can't go all the way forward, you're not going to be able to close the bolt and the rifle's just not going to work and that's a major problem. Uh, the other problem that this led to was that M27 bolts could no longer be used in uh, M91 or M24 rifles because those earlier rifles didn't have the grooves cut and if you tried to install one of these bolts in an older rifle, again, you couldn't close the bolt all the way and it wouldn't work. So in 33 they abandoned that. Uh, on top of these potential problems, they also, I think, realized that this really didn't actually improve anything. It wasn't necessary. Now the 27 would include two improvements to the rear sight. On the original M91s, this is your adjustment uh, lever right there. On the 27, they made it, they gave it these feet, uh, which really do make it a more secure and better uh, adjustment. Holds the rear sight much steadier. That's, it, it's a small thing, but that's definitely an improvement to the rear sight. They also added this plate screwed onto the back of the rear sight, which gives, allows them to cut a more precise and a, a more careful uh, V-notch. So you can see that's kind of been tacked on uh, into the back of the Russian rear sight. So in general, they're making these rifles a little more precise and a little more uh, marksman friendly because the Finns don't have the number of people that the Russians do. What they do have is marksmanship skill. So we can take a look at the markings here on the barrel. That triangle T indicates that uh, the barrel was made by Tika, uh, who did the vast majority of the M27s, by the way. Uh, the D indicates uh, D pattern bullets, which is a slightly different bullet profile than others, uh, kind of like the French rechambered their guns for a couple of different bullet profiles, so did the Finns. Uh, serial number here, 51 and a half thousand, and this is a 1932 gun couple features up here at the nose. We have these nice big protective wings, very sturdy, and there's a hole cut in them so that you can still get there, get to the front sight uh, with a punch so that you can adjust your windage. And then we have a hinged nose cap. So we have a hinge pin on this side. This one is a screw right there. So if you want to take the handguard off, you can remove this screw and this just opens up on the pivot and you can take, get the handguard off. Now the problem with these handguards is that they're attached only to this little skinny section right at the front of the stock by a single screw. And what was discovered by 1935 was that in training and in the field, this was a fragile piece. Um, in particular, if you had a bayonet on the rifle uh, and used it, it was very possible to twist the front of the rifle and crack the stock. Uh, one of the other things the Finns did with the 27 is they gave them a heavier profile barrel than the M91s, the Russian rifles had had, but they were still using refurbished M91 Russian stocks. So they had to hollow more out inside the stock than the Russians had done, and this left it a little more uh, fragile, especially up here at the front. So the solution to this problem of the fragile nose cap was in 1935 to add these uh, so-called popsicle sticks just strengthening ribs and they allow the, the nose cap to be attached back here. Um, this makes the whole thing more rigid and stable. Now it's interesting to note that up here on our early rifle the stock actually has the cutouts for those uh, reinforcing ribs. This is an early rifle that at some point had a damaged stock and the stock was replaced with a later pattern stock with those cutouts. Um, that's not a super common thing but it is it's just one of these very many features where you know, kind of anything can be possible on, on Finnish rifles, um, any combination of parts. So here's another example of that kind of variability. This, which is our later M27, has the improved slider on the rear sight, but it doesn't have that faceplate and notch put on it. And there's no particular good explanation for that. Just these kind of variations happen on Finnish rifles. One other interesting thing that we can note about this early M27 is that it originally had a stock disc. This would have been a brass disc attached to the stock that indicated the unit um, that the rifle was assigned to, and this was done uh, basically as an inventory thing. However, all of these stock discs were removed after the Winter War when it was realized that they were actually providing valuable intelligence uh, to the Soviets when, if and when uh, rifles were captured. Uh, it was a good source of intel about what units were deployed where. 
So after the Winter War, those were all removed, and it is very rare to find one intact today. And in fact, once they started removing them, they stopped cutting these uh, that little detent or uh, depression in the stock for them. So you normally don't even see uh, evidence that there ever would have been a, a disc. Also interesting to note on this one, you can see the original Russian uh, slot in the uh, in the stock for the sling has been filled, and it's had this sling swivel added to the bottom instead. This is yet another of the half a dozen or so different styles of sling swivels that uh, were used by the Finns. We can also look up here on the stock and note that uh, the stock has been spliced out of two pieces. And this was done to increase its strength and rigidity. So while the army was developing their own M27 rifle, the Civil Guard didn't want to get left behind. They wanted a better rifle as well. And what they ended up developing became known as the M28. Now they did get their hands on a, uh, an army M27 during its development and took a look at it and ultimately ended up doing mostly the same things, but they thought there were some places where they could do things either better or more economically. There was a lot of inter-service rivalry between the Civil Guard and the army, not surprisingly. So uh, in total about 35,000 M28s were manufactured, and these were manufactured from 1928 through 1932. Uh, now the Army M27s would go on to be produced all the way until uh, 1940. The Civil Guard would actually make some improvements uh, after around 1932, and that would become known. That would that would be a follow-up version, which we'll take a look at after we're done with this one. So let's take a look at the specific details of the M28. So the front sight has pretty much the same changes made to it. We have some nice big protective ears, a uh, big hole in the sides so that you can access the front sight to adjust your windage. That's important. The Civil Guard didn't apparently see the need for this hinged quick removal front uh, nose cap, so they didn't bother. They just went with a solid normal traditional style of nose cap. And honestly this is probably the biggest single difference between the 27 and the 28. Moving back to the rear sight, we're going to see this typical uh, replacement finish numbering. Uh, this one actually does not have a 200 yard notch cut in it nor does it have the improved adjustment slider. However, it does have a rear plate that was added so that you can get a more precise or a better uh, rear sight picture. Now, in a true display of nitpicking, uh, the M28 Civil Guard rifles have that plate attached by two screws from the top, where the M27 Army rifles have it with two screws from the back. So just a little distinguishing feature you can see there. There are a lot fewer receiver marks on the M28s than the 27s. We just have an SY there for the Civil Guard. We're going to have a serial number on the side. And you'll note that there is in fact an SA Army property mark, despite the fact that this is not an Army rifle. This was an M28 Civil Guard rifle. Well the reason for this is that during the Continuation War in the 1940s, uh, the Army absorbed all of the Civil Guard's rifles, and so almost all of them ended up marked Army property. Now we've been, I've been mentioning some of the different sling adaptations to these rifles in general um, as we've been going through here, and this is one of the more desirable ones. This is one of the cooler ones. These are commonly referred to as ski trooper rifles. In fact, these, this was this, the rear sling setup on the first 6000 M28s, and they were done this way so that you could accommodate a couple different sling positions, most significantly carrying the rifle across your chest, which is how you'd kind of want to carry it skiing. So that's why there is both an upper and a lower sling slot on those. Now after the first 6,000 I guess they decided it wasn't that important and it was a lot of work to add, so they stopped doing it, and most of the M28s you find will only have this bottom slot. Um, in addition of course, uh, when rifles were damaged and refurbished, they wouldn't have added back that, that top slot if it were an earlier rifle that had it. So uh, somewhat scarce variety to find these days. It was realized that there was still room for some improvement uh, in the M28, and the Civil Guard got to work, uh, well, making more modifications. And this would ultimately lead to the Model 28-30, uh, which didn't actually go into production until 1933. Uh, development took a couple of years, trials, etc. Uh, but what they got in the 2830 was really a substantially better rifle. They finally got entirely away from this old Russian uh, style of sight with a brand new, much more secure, and 
overall better rear sight. Um, there were changes, improvements made to the front sight, uh, to the barrel floating, a bunch of things. The 2830 would actually acquire a substantial reputation for accuracy. In 1937 uh, the World Rifle Championships were being held in Helsinki, and Finland actually had the overall winner, uh, one of their shooters, using a 28-30 rifle. Um, really this, this would set the, the stage for the M39 to be adopted by both the Army and the Civil Guard several years later. And the 2830 would in fact be produced until 1940, uh, when production switched over to the, the Model 39. In total 24,400 2830s were manufactured, however there were about 40,000 that existed overall, the remainder being Model 28s that were updated with the new parts and to the new spec. Now the new rear sight was a complete departure from the old Russian sights, and much better overall. Uh, we have a, a much smoother slider here, uh, markings from 200 out to 1000 meters with intermediate notches, so we have a, a pair of spring-loaded catches here, and you can move this sight to 250, or like 275. Uh, a lot of variability and a lot of precision in this sight. Now this was still not a windage adjustable rear sight. It did have, it now had a U-shaped rear notch instead of V, that was preferred, but uh, for Now I should say, there were a small number of M28s that had been made with an adjustable rear sight, where they actually had three plates back here, and the middle one sandwiched in between, you could loosen the, the attachment screws, slide this middle plate back and forth with the rear sight notch and adjust your windage, but that was kind of a haphazard system. And so they replaced that in the 2830 with a system where the front sight was the adjustable one for windage. Now it had always been possible to adjust the front sight windage on these rifles with a punch and just making, you know, tapping the sight blade itself side to side. They made a major improvement on that with the 2830 by now making it screw adjustable. So on the other side we actually have these little dots that give you reference points that you can index against, and all you have to do is take a screwdriver and adjust either one side or the other to move the front sight side to side. So that was a substantial improvement, that really allowed the rifles to be uh, better and more quickly winded zeroed. There were some improvements made up at the nose cap, the stock is thicker up here, you can see this is a slightly later improved variation where there's a reinforcing bolt going through the front of the stock. There's also an aluminum float tube installed in between the barrel and the stock and handguard. Having pulled the nose cap off here, we can this up and you can see this aluminum float sleeve that was added in under the nose cap. So this is a very late production example. We have an S in a gear logo that's indicating a Seiko or a Sako barrel, and then relatively high serial number, 1940 production date here. So this would have been right at the end before they started putting the manufacturing uh, facilities into the M39 rifles. Just an interesting side note because it's present on this rifle, this divot is where the Russian Eagle originally was, the Russian Imperial Eagle marking, on this receiver. Since again all of these, every Finnish Mosin Nagant is built on a Russian receiver, uh, they would occasionally go in and actually remove or deface that Russian Eagle if they didn't like the idea of Russian markings on their weapon that they're currently used to trying to fight the Russians. Now there were also some improvements made to the magazine and the trigger, which I can't really show you here. This example actually doesn't have the improved marking magazine. Um, what they did was basically change the, the pressing style up in the top half of the magazine, just to reduce the possibility of rim lock, which seems to have been a good idea, but not, not a hugely critical one. So finally, all of these different rifle variations got to be a little bit too much. People were tired of dealing with it, and the M39 was developed to unify the, the Civil Guard and the Army armaments and get rid of this hodgepodge of different rifles that had been slowly accumulating through the Finnish inventory system. So the M39 would be the final evolution of this design, and pretty much without argument, the best. So a couple things they did, they took the rear sight 
from the 2830, brought it over, but also added a 150 meter marking to it uh, to make it a little bit more useful. They brought in the hinged nose cap from the M27. They got rid of these half a dozen different types of sling varieties by adding a universal set of sling attachments on the M39. And uh, also, maybe most recognizably, added a semi-pistol grip to the design. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at some of those features. We will start with the rear sight here. As you can see it's the same basic design as the 2830, but we now have that 1.5 marking. So that's, that's going to give you a really nice short range zero when you want it, so that you don't have to try and aim low to make hits at close range. The front sight retains this screw adjustable dot indexed system also from the 2830. The nose cap, however, is going to be of the hinged variety, uh, from uh, developed from the M27, so that you can leave the base of the stock in place and take the handguard off. The barrel band is going to be given a spring latch uh, like, say, Mauser's, and instead of having a cross bolt to hold it in place, so that's going to simplify its removal as well. Um, what you would do is loosen this screw, that releases some of the tension, and then you can push the spring in and slide the barrel band off pretty easily. Now you'll notice here on the barrel band we have two sling swivels, one on the side and one on the bottom. Moving to the buttstock you'll see we have a sling swivel on the bottom and a sling bar on the side. So between the side mounts and the bottom mounts this allows one standard configuration to accommodate every different style of sling attachment. So they finally get rid of all the variety in that. So one other set of changes or standardizations that were made with the M39 relate to the bore itself. Uh, there had been a variety of different uh, exact bore diameters, you know, rifle, uh, land and groove measurements that had been used on the different previous iterations of Finnish Mosin Nagant barrels, and they standardized all of that with the M39. So they went to a .310 bore, which was set up to give optimum accuracy with the Russian manufacturer ammunition, which is what Finland had a lot of, and they changed from a 1 in 9.5 to a 1 in 10 inch twist to the rifling. Again, these were all set up to address some of the accuracy issues that had been um, observed using a variety of ammunition in this variety of pre-existing rifles. The stock was generally improved on the M39 in a number of places. Uh, the pistol grip added here allows for better control of the rifle, and then the stock in general was thickened and strengthened pretty much everywhere. Thicker back here, thicker at the wrist, thicker up at the front, um, no longer susceptible to cracking and breaking under use with the bayonet. In general, they took all of the complaints that had existed about the previous rifles, combined them with all of the best elements of each of those previous rifles, and put together the M39, which would be, as I've said, undoubtedly the best Mos Nagant version ever made. Now in total they made 96,800 of these rifles between 1940 and 1945, so more of these than any of the previous versions. Uh, they did continue to manufacture a small number of them after the war, uh, interestingly in the, the late 1960s and early 70s they still produced a few of them. Uh, total overall production was 102,000. And these remained in Finnish reserve arsenals for a remarkably long time. Um, the last ones weren't gotten rid of until actually the year 2000, believe it or not. One caveat I do need to make is, of course, I have, uh, I have skipped a lot of data. Um, there are a lot of things about markings that I've skipped, a lot of stock variations, things like the splices in the stocks, and one-piece versus two-piece stocks, and who made the barrels during what time periods, I've skipped some of the very scarce varieties, like the sniper versions of each of these, the M27 RV carbines, which are ludicrously rare. Um, this is, it's long enough as, as it has been. Um, this is a general overview of Finnish Mos Nagants. Every single one of these varieties uh, certainly deserves its own video with even more in-depth information. Now there are some fantastic Finnish rifle and Mos Nagant in general, resources out there. Um, I've got some links in the description text below, so definitely if you're interested in learning more there is lots more that can be learned about these, and don't hesitate to check those out.
Finnish Mosinagants really, I think, are just a playground, a fantastic playground for collectors. Not only did they all start as something different, namely Russian Mosinagant uh, rifles, but then as the Winter War and the Continuation War both happened, the, the Civil Guard rifles and the Army rifles got intermingled, Civil Guard rifles were repaired at Army depots, and almost all the parts became in some ways interchangeable and upgradable. So you'll find older guns with every conceivable version of uh, later hardware added to them. You'll find the pistol grip M39 stocks on any of these when the original stock broke and it went to the depot and what do we have? Well we have M39 stocks so we'll put one of those on the rifle and send it back out into the field. Uh, in this way they're kind of like World War I French rifles where just huge fantastic variety to choose from and I think it helps you really get a taste for how the war, what happens during wartime for arsenals like this. Oh. At any rate uh, we have the five here in front of me plus a couple others that you saw earlier and there are several others beyond those also in uh, this auction at Rock Island, uh, a whole bunch of M39s in particular. Those are of course the most common ones of all of these to find. So if you're interested in any of the ones we looked at in the video, take a look at the description text below. I have links there to each particular auction lot. Now these are in all, I think in all cases uh, batches of rifles, so it's not just one, it's four or five or six rifles together. So on Rock Island's catalog you can take a look at the pictures and description and price estimates for all the guns in each lot, and uh, place bids right there online if you're interested in them. And if you are interested, don't forget to search through the catalog to find the other examples that they also have that didn't make it into the video. Thanks for watching.